Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Once again, we focus attention on the middle income trap concept and whether India could get stuck in it. My guest today believes the concept is not robust and that chances of India getting caught in the middle income trap are very small. He's a former chief economic advisor, the author of this recently published book, India at 100, and presently he's India's executive director at the International Monetary Fund, Krishnamurti Subramanian. Dr. Subramanian, before I discuss why you don't believe the middle income trap concept is robust and why India is unlikely to get stuck in it, let me start by asking you for your definition of the middle income trap concept. First of all, Karan, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be chatting with you on this very important aspect. Um, so as I've covered in my book, uh, the concept of the middle income trap, I think the, the term itself actually clearly gives away its definition. It is the idea that uh, middle income countries will remain trapped in the middle income status and will not be able to upgrade themselves to high income. Um, the argument that is postulated um, for this is that uh, compared to both low income countries and uh, high income countries, middle income countries would find it more difficult to uh, to, to grow. And uh, that's why they will remain in the middle income trap. That's the essence, essence of the definition. Now, in your book, you have two reasons for believing that the middle income trap concept is not robust. I'll go through both of those one by one. First, you point out that between 2000 and 2015, more than half the countries that were considered middle income transitioned to high income. So I take it you're saying that it's only a minority get, that gets stuck in the middle income status. The majority transition and become high income and developed. So apart from the point that you mentioned, Karan, which I definitely cover in the um, in the chapter on the middle income trap, I've titled it "Is it Des Is the Middle Income Trap Destiny?" and um, I provide evidence to show that it is not. Uh, there are multiple reasons. First, let me start out by the definition of the middle income trap in terms of the quantitative measures. Uh, the idea is that if you uh, lay out the trap to be very large. For instance, let's say, you know, to give an example, if the trap is, let's say, not just this big room, but also the entire IMF building, then I'm sure many mouses will definitely be caught. But if on the other hand, uh, you know, the trap is is small, you know, the usual mouse trap, then obviously the chance of a mouse getting caught is lower. What does this mean, you know, in the context of the middle income trap? That even a country that grows its GDP per capita 12 times, 12 times, um, I emphasize no less, um, will be stuck in the middle income trap the, the way the definition is provided. So in that sense, I think, you know, it becomes a little meaningless because, you know, 12 times uh, growth in GDP per capita is certainly non-trivial, right? Um, now, second, if you look at the the, the premise, which is what, uh, you know, the middle income trap is based on that middle income countries will grow slower compared to low income or, you know, high income countries. Again, the evidence supporting this particular thesis is quite uh, tenuous. Um, if you look at the 
time period you know from uh, you know from um, from 2000 onwards um, and 2000 to 2022 you know that that period out of that except for 3 years you know every other year uh, upper middle income countries actually grew at uh, growth rates that are faster than every other category and it is important to keep in mind that the upper middle income uh, countries are the ones that according to this theory would face the greatest headwind right um, let me complete the you know i i'm i'm i know i'm curious to you're curious to ask me a, a rejoinder uh, the third is exactly as i pointed out 50% of more than 50% of upper middle income countries actually did transition and so uh you know if you look at it from the evidence perspective the middle income trap one the definition is actually quite uh, you know uh, uh, too broad to have to have you know meaningful um, implications and at the same time the evidence supporting the mechanism is quite tenuous too so you're saying two very important things one that the definition is almost self serving if you broaden it to such an extent a lot of countries will look as they've got caught in it but that is simply a definitional problem nothing more and the second thing you're saying even with that broad definition the majority of countries do transition from middle to high income they don't get stuck it's only a small minority that do that's the first reason now yeah. let me put you at this point can, can i just add one more aspect to that karan um, i think even if you look at it you know in you know on that definition about a more than 100 countries 108 countries today are you know in the middle income status that also tells you another way why this definition is too broad to be meaningful Now what you're saying of course is very different to what Indermeet Gill the chief economist of the World Bank and the author of the middle income trap concept said to me just 8 days ago on the 9th of October he said that between 1990 and 2023 only 34 countries had transitioned from middle income to high income your facts and your argument is very different to his No, I don't think the facts are different, Karan. Let me explain. Um, see, it's important to look at the percentage of countries because you know the number of countries in and itself do not mean much. And let me explain. For instance, suppose in 1990, let's say there were 40 countries that were middle income and 34 of them transitioned to to let's say high income. Then you would say that 90% of these countries actually have transitioned. That would suggest that the middle income trap is actually absolutely non-existent. In contrast. trust if suppose the base you know in 1990 there were 100 countries that you know that basically were in middle income and 34 countries transitioned then you are looking at about a third of the country so in other words what i'm pointing out is that 34 countries in and itself you know doesn't give you much of an idea because you have to look at the base you know of countries that were middle income in 1990 to infer this and here you know to put this in context uh, if you look at in 1996 Forty-six countries were were high income. Okay, thirty-four um, countries joined that precisely along the lines that you know Indermit is talking about. In other words, more than seventy percent, you know, growth in the number of countries that basically you know are are high income. So, so you know, saying, his facts. So you're saying that by citing the number of countries rather than the percentage of countries that have transitioned from middle income to high income, Indermit Gill is actually giving a misleading picture of the quantity. The quantity in percentage terms is a lot greater than it seems in absolute numbers. That's the point you're making. No, I I don't know in what context he might have actually told this to you, but in I think in this context we were talking about the middle income trap and how effective you know, I, it is. In the same context as I'm talking to you. I I understand that but I think within the you know within the questioning that you might have have, have uh, you know done to him actually but I think the point that I'm trying to make is that in and itself and this is something which I've you know believed and I'll give you an example from a different context you know before the elections there were a few social media influencers who were talking about the rupee levels of debt etc in general without normalizing with a correct metric right without a baseline I think numbers in and itself are actually meaningless and that's the point that I'm making here so just to finish that thought um i think if for instance there's been a growth of 70% in the number of countries that basically you know attained high income st status from 1990 to 2023 that sits well with the fact that i actually that you highlighted which is that more than half of the countries actually you know uh, uh, did actually transition I'll come to the second reason why you believe the middle income trap is not robust in a moment's time but all I'll simply say not in defense of 
Mr. Gill, but simply in the explanation of what he said, he cited that figure of 34 countries between 1990 and 2023 to clearly suggest that only a small number transition from middle income to high income. You're saying when you look at it in percentage terms, actually it's above 50 percent. It's not therefore in numbers. It may be small, but in percentage terms, it's much, much bigger. Let's then come. Let me clarify. Uh, let me clarify, Karan. I think all, what I'm saying is, and I don't know what number he had in mind. You know, when he when he was saying 34 as small, as I gave you the example, if it is 34 out of 40, that is certainly not small. Absolutely. If it is 34 out of 100, even then. And you made that then, point very effectively. So let's not repeat the point. It's a difference between how large the number seems in percentage terms and how large it seems in absolute numbers. And certainly exactly. what Dr. Gill was doing was quote the absolute numbers to suggest that the number that transition from middle to high income is small. Now, the second exactly. reason why you believe the middle income trap is not robust is because you say the reasons why economies slow down could be mm -hmm. the result of global economic factors that may have little to do with the middle income trap. Are you therefore saying that when these global economic factors change or at least ameliorate, these countries will progress and transition to high income? It's a matter of time and waiting for these factors to ameliorate rather than a permanent block. Actually, I'm making, in my opinion, an even more powerful point. Um, what I'm saying is, you know, the, the concept of the middle income trap is that intrinsically, and I think I emphasize that word intrinsically, there's something that actually sort of inhibits middle income countries from being able to grow as fast as the high income countries or the low income countries. In other words, you know, the, this theory is about some intrinsic aspects. Now, when you look at the, you know, the growth uh, slowdowns, let's say in low income countries and middle income countries, if you find them to be as prevalent, you know, in middle income countries as low income countries, then it's very hard to attribute this to actually some intrinsic features of the middle income countries. It has to be global economic factors that is driving this aspect, which then puts really into question the conceptual argument that there's something intrinsically wrong with you know, middle income countries. That's the point that I'm trying to make. Absolutely. And I understand it. You're saying that global economic factors can slow down all economies, be they small, yes. middle or high income. But when Correct. they slow down middle income, it mustn't be interpreted as a middle income trap. It's the same Correct. factor that will affect high and low income countries. And when those global economic factors ameliorate, the middle income yep. will continue to grow and transition to high income. Absolutely well said. Now, let's come at this point to what you say in your book, and I'll hold it up for the audience once again, what you believe are the root causes of the middle income trap. In this book, you identify three. And I again, take you through them one by one. First, it's the failure to eliminate subsidies and protections that once upon a time helped countries enter middle income, but now have begun to hinder the transition from middle to high income. What sort of subsidies and what sort of protections do you have in mind? So I make a deeper point here, Karan, um, that when you look at the way in which an economy grows, transitions, right? Um, you know, if the country does not dynamically refine and evolve its economic model, then it is likely to be stuck in the middle income trap. You know, and the examples that the economic literature uses, you have on the one hand, Latin American countries that have been actually stuck in the middle income trap. In contrast, East Asian economies have actually been able to escape the middle income trap. And there are important lessons in there. Um, so if you take, for instance, the Latin American countries, the subsidies that they gave to their you know, to various firms in order for them to grow from low income to middle income, that created powerful vested interests and you know those powerful vested interests then basically blocked further reform and that may then basically resulted in these countries being stuck in the middle income trap now in the in the indian context and which is what you know i'm sure you and the and the readers are actually or viewers are, are keen to know about um, it is important to understand i'll give you the example of agriculture um, you know in the in the 1960s um, when india was a country that was facing food shortages we had put in some policies at that point in time you know which served well at that point in time but as we've evolved now and you can see for instance there is a large 
you know, powerful vested interest that essentially is represented by farmers, large farmers in Punjab, you know, they have actually grown to become the vested interest that blocks reform. And I think there is an and important they did. lesson in that. You could add, they did when Mr. Modi attempted to reform the farm laws with this agriculture. Exactly. The farmers protested and Mr. Modi had to back off. So you're right. Vested uh, let, let me refine that. Vested, let me refine that a little bit. Uh, I simply think vested interest created around the protection of subsidies that they're getting can actually yes. speed the growth of an economy from middle to high income. Those vested interests need to be persuaded to drop their objection. And those subsidy protections need to be slowly but steadily weeded out. Correct. Yeah, yes. And, and, and just a small refinement. You know, I think it's not just any farmer, right? It's the large farmers from Punjab. You know, they are the ones that are benefiting from the status quo. And in fact, you know, in the book, actually, I, I write a particular chapter on agricultural re renaissance, arguing that the current status quo actually hurts the small farmer. For all the rhetoric that we see among in the polity, this is something that actually, you know, there isn't that much being done for the small farmer. Now, the second root cause of the middle income trap, according to your book, is what you call relying on traditional industrial policy tools and neglecting efforts to promote knowledge and innovation. Are you just talking about skills and technology or are you also referring to significant advances in education? So uh, I think. The points that you're mentioning are all part of what I'm talking about. Um, you know, more broadly, I'm talking about the need for productivity improvements in the economy, um, you know, of which innovation, entrepreneurship, um, knowledge creation are all definitely, you know, uh, aspects, but they're not the, the only ones. There are actually other uh, sources as well. And, you know, I, I want to particularly point out three uh, drivers because, you know, while you are referring mostly to the chapter on the middle income trap, across 27 chapters in the book, I've actually laid out all the policies that India needs to, you know, implement in order to, for it to be able to grow its GDP per capita. And that is my emphasis, not necessarily on the on the middle income trap itself if but, you the allow me. But, but the important thing you're saying and i'm just going back to that quotation that i read out a moment ago relying on traditional industrial policy tools and neglecting to promote knowledge and innovation is one root yeah. cause of the middle income trap no I, I i understand with you that is the quote that you're actually picking up from the chap from chapter five on the middle income trap. But as I just explained to you, Karan, before that, you know, the middle income trap phenomenon itself is not as robust. What I am actually interested in is, you know, multiplying India's GDP per capita. Absolutely. We're not saying different things. I'm simply saying that as far as we're talking about the middle income trap, which is the subject we're talking about today, a second root cause is this one. Let's then. I agree. Let's but but can I. Yeah, can I just explain this aspect, right? Because, you know, I think the, the what I'm trying to say is if India, for instance, multiplies its GDP per capita enough number of times, then the middle income trap is sort of is a, you know, we don't have to care about it as it is. Actually, it's a, not a very robust definition. And just to explain on that, three things that I think are very important from productivity growth. One is formalization of the economy, because formalization is something that enhances productivity significantly. Even today, India's, you know, economy actually significantly informal. Second, and at this moment, I'm not talking about India specifically. Let's wait for the India section in a moment's time. At this moment, I'm simply trying to explain to the audience what you believe are root causes of the middle income trap, whether it's India that's caught in it, Indonesia, Brazil, Turkey, Egypt. So let's make this country non-specific. Let's concentrate Fair on enough. the concept for a moment. Now, the Fair third enough. root cause of the middle income trap, according to your book, is the fact that institutions may not keep pace with increasingly complex economies, leading, you say, to corruption and also poor accountability. I take it you're talking about institutions like the media, the judiciary, parliament or the functioning of parliament, the police or the impartiality of the police, as well as a whole host of regulatory bodies that determine how various aspects of the economy function. Am I right in saying that's what you mean when you talk about institutions not keeping pace with an increasingly complex economy? So partially, um, what I'm talking about is, look, you know, middle income trap is, an, is a basically an economic idea. And when we talk about, you know, uh, those that, uh, you know, and, and when you look at countries that have been stuck in those middle income trap and those that have escaped, 
it is essentially you know institutions that you know hinder or further economic progress that is really the focus um, and and one of the key aspects here that i want to focus on is that building a competitive economy a economy that encourages healthy competition you know for instance through entrepreneurship which you know who entrepreneurs who actually challenge incumbent firms that is an essential element of this you know of this institutional building um, the ones that you're talking about are more important from a social perspective but from an economic perspective what what is important really are institutions that encourage more competition but you need the competition in the economy you need for example a fair judiciary one that is objective because it will then be adjudicating over any disputes to do with contracts certainly this want to know that the contract they signed the arrangement they've made is watertight and will be upheld and a fair right. objective professional judiciary gives them that guarantee without that guarantee Agreed. they'll be reluctant to put their money no i agree i think in fact i'm the i'm among the first to actually acknowledge that the you know enforcement of contracts you know is is a critical element for the economy and the second thing that's also critical is that you mustn't have gender based or sex based or faith or religion based disqualifications that keep that keep people out of the economy because then your productivity is affected by the fact that certain categories of your population can't fully participate their equal full participation is essential to realize the full potential of the country that's another area where institutions become fundamental to the functioning of the economy no i i think now you're actually starting to border on ideological aspects karan um not as much you know and and i know you you have a certain you know you have a certain conviction a certain ideology uh, these aren't aspects that actually are as economically robust as you're making out to be um, and that is why i wanted to explain to you i think the more important ones are you know those that encourage productivity in the economy because you brought that up and here you know while the ones that you're talking about th- those would be ones that you actually might want to emphasize i would emphasize three things the reason i mentioned this is because in the mid gill in the interview he gave me on the 9th of october specifically talked about how economies can be slowed down and growth can be affected productivity can be affected if gender based inequalities and faith based inequalities impede the population fully participating he gave that to me as one of the reasons why countries get trapped in the middle income and one of the things they need to tackle and cure if they want to escape the middle income trap no i you know uh, karan i have a lot of respect for indimit but what i want to talk about is actually the ideas that i have espoused in my book uh, i'm sure indimit got his opportunity to actually explain his ideas um, i think what i'm trying to emphasize here is productivity improvements and yeah. for productivity improvements the three key aspects that are really critical uh, and i think once where th- there is you know, in uh, there are important encouraging signs are one is the formalization of the economy every economist agrees that informal sector firms are far less productive than you know than formal sector firms and there is significant runway for catch up growth you know and, and through productivity there second and let me finish this point uh, you know current because it's important um the second is the uh, you know catch up of productivity of the formal sector firms itself they're not as productive and here's where innovation and entrepreneurship some of the improvements now we're actually ranked 39th in innovation using the global innovation index compared to 85 in 2015 the entrepreneurial ecosystem actually we are the third largest econ- entrepreneurial the ecosystem third- and third yes i let me come to that just a minute like i think these are important facts that you know that our viewers need to understand the fact that new firm creation grew at 3.2% from 2000 let me finish that point karan please uh, go ahead i'm not stopping you i'm not yeah, stopping you go uh, ahead yeah yeah that that the uh, new firm creation actually grew only at 3.2% this is world bank data from 2004 to 2014 while it has grown at orders of magnitude higher from 2014 onwards which is something that will encourage productivity growth among formal sector firms yeah. and the third is actually credit creation and this is also you know given the public digital infrastructure that india has created and has leapfrogged you know the, the entire global economy I, I we have enormous that. scope there I understand what you're saying but in that case please tell the audience what are the and I'm quoting you what are the institutions which may not keep pace with increasingly complex economies leading to corruption and poor accountability if it's not the institutions I brought up which are judiciary media parliament police etc then what are the institutions you have in mind 
No, I think judiciary is an institution that you rightly pointed out, and I the agree others? with you as well. The others, uh, apart from the bureaucracy, I think you know that's one of the key key elements as well. And I've I've covered a chapter on bureaucratic reform. Um, you know, it's important for and and I'll give you a particular uh, you know a, a example here to to uh, to to really underline this point. In 2014, there was this chess match between you know Bill Gates, very smart guy, and Magnus Carlsen, the world chess champion. And you know how you know how long that match lasted? Just forty-four seconds. Um, you know, Magnus Carlsen made mincemeat of Bill Gates. The point I'm making here is that specialization. Magnus Carlsen is a specialist in chess. Actually, made mincemeat of a generalist. And this is an area we have to focus on in order for actually to to ensure that you know the necessary productivity improvements and the institutional aspects are 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 enabled. Uh, ap- apart from that, there are others as well that I've covered. But you know, we'll talk about that later, maybe. Let's now try and relate what you call the three root causes of the middle income trap to India. The truth is, each of these three root causes applies to India. We have a plethora of subsidies and protections that continue needlessly. You yourself brought up the example of agricultural subsidies and the inability of the government to reform and change them. The government had to back down because the farmers insisted. Secondly, we've neglected primary and secondary education for decades. There's no doubt about it that India's education system is badly wanting. And thirdly, many of our institutions. Are in disrepair. Just to take up the bureaucracy, we have a bureaucracy that can be particularly sticky and difficult. And our judicial system, our industrial say, doesn't always actually stand up for the contracts that are signed. It finds way of getting around them. So, if all three of your root causes apply to India, why do you believe India is unlikely to get stuck in a middle income trap? Your argument suggests it's very likely to get stuck. So this question reminds me of something that I fundamentally believed in, Karan. That a you know while a cynic chooses to focus on the challenges underlying in an opportunity, a visionary focuses on the opportunity that underlies a challenge. Um, and I think uh, while I'm certainly not uh, um, denying that there are challenges, and you know we need to find those opportunities, which is the way I've written about it. And I think we've already had a discussion. I hope you're persuaded. that the middle income trap is not a very robust empirical or conceptual phenomenon and therefore the you know first thing the possibility of Indi- india being stuck in a phenomenon that is mostly for you know it's not a very robust one i think is it's a non starter in some sense right but what we really need to focus on are ways to increase our per capita gdp and here's where you know the momentum that we've gathered on many of these factors for instance let me give you a particular example and as i said earlier as well countries that refine their economic models as they progress are ones that avoid the middle income trap and here india i think has provided that example unlike the latin american economies for instance allow me to actually you know elaborate this point um if you look at from 2014 to 2024 onwards growth has been very inclusive and i actually can give you data for instance we'll get poverty from 12.2% using the world bank data to 2.2 12.2% in 2012 to 2.2% similarly if you look at the consumption inequality both rural areas and urban areas gini has gone down in other words india has refined its model for growth to be more inclusive so these are aspects similarly you know we had a lot of crony cronyism and crony lending from 2004 to 2014 again something that banking sector has been cleaned up in other words what i'm saying is the evidence that india has been able to refine its economic models as it has progressed is ample for me to actually focus on the opportunity that exists in some of these challenges rather than get drawn down into actually just focusing on the challenges within the opportunity as you would like to believe let me raise two questions connected to what you said with you you began this answer by talking about the fact that we need to raise per capita gdp by multiples Yes, Now, a World Bank report that came out in August—that's just two months ago—called, in fact, the middle income trap. Specifically, says that it will take India seventy-five years, not one, two, three, ten, or fifteen, or twenty, but seventy-five years to increase its per capita income from where it is today, which is roughly three thousand seven hundred, eight hundred dollars, to one quarter. of america's per capita income which is $20,000 so in other words the jump from $3,700 to $20,000 will take 75 years 
Karan, here's where I think, um, you know, we have to be careful that the World Bank itself, when we, when it, when, you know, it talks about poverty, it does not define it in, you know, nominal dollar terms. It uses the purchasing power parity concept. In other words, what is the purchasing power parity? You know, the ability of an Indian to be able to buy goods and services. And I think that is important. I disagree with that characterization, you know, uh, that because in the book I've pointed out, you know, in the, in the first few chapters that if India can grow at 8%, India can have a $40,000 per capita in nominal, in nominal terms. Um, even if India grows at 6%, you know, India can have a per capita GDP of $20,000. And I've done the, the, you know, the, the rigorous analysis and the economic arguments to lay this out. One of the problems with a lot of this, you know, the analysis that's been done is that they've not taken into account an important regime shift that has happened in India, which will affect our, you know, rate of depreciation of the rupee vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. I don't think any of that has been taken into account. This is just more mostly linear extrapolation, you know, and, and from there. In any case, I think, you know, uh, any prediction, one has to actually be careful, you know, whether it is, you know, mine or theirs, we will have to actually assess, you know, whether that, that turns out to be, I don't believe their prediction, 75 years is too long, but I think, you know, uh, they, they might have their reasons to say what they're saying. Let me then raise the second concern that emerges from what you've been saying, and I'm going to quote once again from this book. I'm holding it up for the audience to see. You say in the book, when productivity improvements are accompanied by improvements in rule of law and reduction in corruption, this combination provides a sufficient condition for escaping the middle income trap. The problem is many people believe that the rule of law and corruption are not plus points in India. We're not seeing improvements in them in India. They are major causes of concern in India. And secondly, do we really have the sort of improvements in productivity that are necessary? Many would say that on both counts, India is going to get stuck in the trap, not break out of it. Let, let me, um, you know, uh, use your, the second part of your question first. Um, to highlight that, you know, using the pen world tables data, this is not government data, by the way, um, from 2002 to 2013, the rate of growth of productivity in India was 1.3% per annum, you know, pay attention to this number. From 2014 onwards, you know, uh, uh, the, the product rate of productivity growth is 2.7% per annum, which is more than double the, you know, the rate of productivity growth from 2002 to 2013. This is using, using pen world tables data. So the claim that India has has not grown its productivity is something that is actually not well founded in data, number one. Um, number two, when it comes to, um, as I was mentioning earlier, India has indeed refined its economic model. If you look at, for instance, more than 500 million bank accounts, and I actually do not miss a single opportunity to remind my colleagues here on the IMF board that we have as many poor people having bank accounts as one and a half times the population of the country that, you know, IMF is based in the United States. Um, and these are ones that have actually led to significant, you know, inclusive growth. Um, each one of these bank accounts actually is now well active as well not just that if you look at things like for instance but, but what, about, Bhad... what about rule of law and reduction in corruption those were the other two conditions in that quotation of yours that i read out rule of law most people would say is often not happening in india at all full stop and corruption is rampant reduction in corruption is what the country is crying for no, I, I here again. I actually, that's what I was, I was, I was, you know, explaining to you, Karan. That when you look at corruption, right, and that's why the bank accounts that I brought up is is critical because through the use of the Trinity, the Jam Trinity, Jandan, Aadhaar, Mobile, now, you know, corruption in delivery of welfare has there's been significant improvement with several trillion rupees actually being saved. You know, these were uh, amounts that were actually eaten away by intermediaries, and that has actually reduced. I'm not going to claim here that all corruption is gone. But I think the point I'm making is there's been significant momentum on some of these aspects. When it comes to the rule of law as well, you know, and, and the particular dimension I want to focus on is from the economic perspective, the, you know, for instance, if you look at the ease of doing business, we used to be ranked in the 150s, you know, in 2014, you know, when the World Bank ranking stopped, we were in the, you know, uh, in the 60s, right? There's been significant, you know, momentum there. So these are aspects, again, I think, you know, one, that, one of the aspects, and I want to emphasize for the for our viewership that, you know, uh, 
when it comes to bad bad outcomes right um you know when it comes to good outcomes good thinking is something that is necessary but for bad outcomes you know uh, negative thinking is more than sufficient and there are enough people and sometimes you know actually and often times you and your you know uh, and your other friends do a very good job of providing the sufficient condition of always beating down on the negatives i think there are enough positives as well and that is what i am trying to highlight there are challenges let me not i'm an impatient about removing these challenges but in those challenges i see opportunities based on what we've achieved over the last you know not just 10 years which has been phenomenal but over the last 30 years itself since let me once again quote indermeet gill and i'm not doing that to rile you even though i know it doesn't so no, i'm not riled up at all but this is what he said to me explicitly and i'm quoting him on the 9th of october he said the odds are against india becoming a high income developed country there's no guarantee you're saying to me you almost completely disagree with him i think as we've already discussed um the middle income trap itself conceptually and empirically is a very tenuous phenomenon um so uh, the the concept of being stuck in a middle income trap when the phenomenon itself is tenuous i think is a non starter to start with you know number one uh, more importantly and i think you know in the chapter on middle income trap i start by i motivate the chapter by appealing to a scripture that you know i've benefited a lot from reading the yoga vashishta it talks about self effort and the importance you know of that in overcoming destiny i think the point i am trying to make and i you know nobody can say that what is going to happen 20 years later 25 years later is a certainty nor can one say that it basically will never happen i think these are because the future is uncertain but i think the important point is that india has shown its ability to refine its economic models there are challenges definitely you know on productivity growth on some of these you know on improvement in rule of law and ensuring that subsidies are discontinued when the right time time is appropriate these are aspects that we have to do not just that we also have to actually further you know more more more, more on on human capital on bureaucracy judiciary etc and across 27 chapters i've laid that out but i actually look at these as opportunities not the challenges that professional pessimists you know seem to always talk about finally on the middle income trap i'm once again quoting from your book and i'll hold it up for the audience to see you say there are several things that countries can do to ensure they don't get stuck in the middle income trap i'll very quickly repeat some of them you say first of all industrial policy support must have sunset clauses secondly trade protections for domestic farms cannot be permanent third india needs to enhance its export penetration and participation in global value chains fourth we need significant if not huge investment in manufacturing fifth reform of the bureaucracy improvement in the rule of law and the ending of corruption and finally we need a very significant improvement in secondary and tertiary education and my question is a very simple one is the modi government today doing enough of this not just is it doing it but is it doing it to the extent that is required and necessary yes um if you look at the growth last year karan at 8% um you know india's growth you know india has been the fastest growing economy since covid you know we grew out of covid despite professional pessimists basically talking about you know very very negative scenarios at that point in time india has emerged you know with very strong macro fundamentals and let me emphasize for the first time in its 75 year old history has india actually done much better than advanced economies i think that is evidence that you know that the right policies are being put in place now when it comes to i think there is you know i am an impatient person from from the perspective of policy there is more that needs to be done but i think there is significant progress on these as i mentioned about the productivity improvements as well you know the formalization of the economy that has happened the growth in in entrepreneurship i mean mentioned you know 3.2% in the previous decade you know orders of magnitude higher growth in innovation all these are aspect the public digital infrastructure which can be a very critical aspect so these are all very important you know uh, areas where there's been significant momentum and therefore i'm optimistic that we can continue to grow to be able to avoid the what is anyway a very tenuous concept of the middle income trap finally dr subramanian i'm going to move away from the middle income trap because i'm talking to you i want to finally end by briefly discussing something else that is in the preface of this book and i raise it because if it's true it's tantalizing but the question is is it true or not you say 
India at 100 can be a $55 trillion economy if we can grow at 8% levels annually for two decades. Actually, it's exactly 23 years between now and 2047 when India will be 100. But the Mm -hmm. truth is, India hasn't grown at 8% levels for more than three, four years at a time before lapsing back to 6 and 5% levels. So can we sustain 8% growth per annum for 23 years? I, you know, I think that's a very good question um, and something that I reflected the most up, upon, you know, in writing this book. If you look at the data, and you know, on average, India has grown at more than 7% from 1991 onwards. So 8% is a stretch goal, but a goal that I think is eminently achievable as of actually, you know, using bottoms up, ab initio, thinking of actually laid it out, you know, the potential growth that India can have, uh, India can grow at 8%. By, you know, and, and I think it's important to understand that this growth is catch up growth primarily, unlike, for instance, let's say in the advanced economies and the three things that I mentioned, your, you know, formalization, formal firms catching up with the productivity of the, you know, peers, you know, in the advanced economies, credit creation. And here, I think I just want to point out some data. If you look at the private credit to GDP ratio, you know, world average is, is 180% in 2020. India is only 58%. With the amount of, you know, uh, the, the public digital infrastructure that we've created, we can increase credit and thereby productivity in the economy. So let me la- now lay out, I think, and, and uh, I need a couple of minutes of uninterrupted, you know, to be able to explain how that $55 trillion economy comes about. If India grows at 8% with inflation at 5%, that's 13% in nominal rupee terms. Um, you know, I estimate that the rate of depreciation of the rupee will be about you know, less than 1% if India grows at 8% because of the inflation targeting regime that India has put in place. Uh, we know which basically will reduce the inflation and has already reduced and thereby depreciation. So 13 minus 1 is 12%. At 12%, you know, and the rule of 72, something that we use, you know, GDP multiplies in multiplies, you know, it becomes double every six years. From 2023 to 2047 is a 24 year period. 24 divided by six is four. So there's basically going to be four doublings. Two into two into two into two. That is 16 times. India's GDP in 2023 was 3.28 trillion. So the first multiplication, first doubling takes us to about 6.5. Second one to 13, third one to 26, and the fourth one to 52. That's close to the 55 trillion number that we actually have. Um, And I think this is based on the premise that earlier inflation used to be more than 7%. After the inflation targeting targeting regime was put in place in 2016, India's inflation has declined to 5%. As a result, and one of the credos in international economics is that a currency that faces lower depreciation will face, you know, will face lower inflation, will face you know, lower depreciation. And based on that, I'm actually projecting that India's, you know, the rate of de- rupee depreciation will be lower, thereby, you know, impacting uh, the rate of growth in dollar terms and leading to this $55 trillion economy, if we can grow at 8%, which is ambitious, but achievable. Let me put, and this is my last question, a counter contrary view. Ernst and Young have forecast that India in 2047 will only be a 26 trillion economy. That's just about half of your 55 trillion target. Goldman Sachs says it will take right up to 2075, another 50 years for India to get to 50 trillion. Why do you believe you're right and they're wrong? Um, I think that I'm glad you asked that question. Um, The main difference between my assessment and theirs is that they're actually missing, you know, the the key element that I explained to you, which is the impact of the inflation targeting regime that we implemented in 2016 on the rate of depreciation. So let me explain. If, for instance, as I've shown, the rate of depreciation is likely of the rupee is likely to be less than 1%. In contrast, historically, India's rate of depreciation has been about 3.5% on average. Um, so about 3%. So they're, they're projecting rupee depreciation to be about 3% more than, you know, 
what what is likely to be given the important macroeconomic development that I talked about in 2016, the inflation targeting regime. So now if 3%, you know, the rupee depreciates at 3% more, instead of growing at 12%, the, the, the you know, GDP grows at 9% in, in dollar terms, which then means, again, rule of 72, GDP doubles every eight years, nine times eight is 72. Now 2023 to 2047, you only get three doublings, 24 divided by eight, and that ends at 26 trillion. As I said, 3.28 to 8 to 6.5, 6.5 to 13, 13 to 26. So the most important aspect, in my opinion, you know, they've just extrapolated linearly, you know, on the on the, on the rate of depreciation that has prevailed in the past. In contrast, I've actually thought deeply about it, taking into account the significant dec decline in inflation and the impact of that for depreciation. That is where the key difference is between my assessment and that of Goldman Sachs and Ernst Young. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Subramaniam. Let me end by saying, regardless of the questions I may have asked, which to your ears would have sounded cynical, I'm sure every Indian hopes you're right. We all want to be a $55 exactly. trillion dollar economy in 2047. The only question is, will we be alive to enjoy it? That's the doubt I'm sure you can't answer. <laughs> I hope certainly, I pray that all of us actually are indeed alive and healthy to actually see that good outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Subramaniam. Take care, stay safe. You too. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.